Good morning, good afternoon, and especially good evening to the viewers in Asia, since it is 9 p.m. back home in Hong Kong, and welcome to our AF AFC Fund webinar. My name is Thomas Hooker, and I'm the CEO and founder of Asia Frontier Capital. With me today are Ruchi Desai in Hong Kong, who is managing with me the AFC Asia Frontier Fund, Ahmed Tabakchali, the chief strategist of the AFC Iraq Fund, who is normally based in Iraq, but is currently on home leave in London, UK. Scott Osherhoff, the Chief Investment Officer of the AFC Uzbekistan Fund, joins us from Tashkent in Uzbekistan. And Andreas Vogelsanger, the CEO of the Vietnam Fund, who will up update us about the situation in Vietnam. This webinar will last about 45 minutes. And thereafter, you will have the opportunity to ask questions during our 15 minutes Q&A session of, after the presentation. You can submit your questions online through the Q&A icon at the bottom of this Zoom window during the entire webinar. Nobody else besides the AFC staff will be able to see your questions. In the past four months, there was never a dull day in our AFC universe. The year started with social unrest in Kazakhstan, followed by political instability in Pakistan, which resulted in the, uh, in the change of the prime minister and thereafter monetary issues in Sri Lanka. But also globally, 2022 was marked by the attack on Ukraine by Russia, which led to higher commodity and higher energy, energy prices and also higher consumer prices and finally higher interest rates. Now, uh, Ruchia will provide us with an update and outlook for the AFC Asia Frontier Fund. Thanks. Great, thank you, Thomas, and welcome everyone to our uh, webinar on all AFC funds. And I will talk about the AFC Asia Frontier Fund for a, for a brief moment, and I'll walk you through exactly how our fund has performed and what's exactly happening in our markets, as well as the impact from the external events, as well as the outlook for Asian frontier markets. So let's get started off. So, in terms of if you look at the the way the year has begun for basically the global markets as a whole. It's not been a great start given what's happening globally with you know Russia, Ukraine, uh, with the Fed getting more aggressive on interest rates hikes, high inflation. So a lot of a uh, lot of noise around the markets right now, and that's basically led to pretty much a, a volatile vol vol volatility across the board, uh, not just in Asian frontier markets, but pretty much globally, even in the U.S. and, and Europe and other emerging markets. Mm -hmm. But I would like to point out one thing is that the fact that Asian frontier markets had a very strong 2021. In fact. Most Asian frontier markets were amongst the top performing markets globally in 2021. Uh, Mongolia was the top performing market globally last year. Vietnam had a strong performance. Bangladesh did well. Kazakhstan did well. So we had a pretty strong performance last year. Uh, so yeah, you, you could you could say that you know that some of the markets have taken a breather this year for the first couple of months. But if you look at some of the other larger emerging markets, especially in the region in Asia, they've had they've had they're having. Uh, not just a poor 2022, they've been having a poor last few years. If you look at Philippines, it's the third year in a row now they have a negative return since 2020. China as well was pretty weak last year and this year as well, of course, as we all know, as they are going through a pretty, uh, pretty tough time right now. Uh, so I would say Asian frontier markets from that perspective had a pretty strong 2021. And yeah, 2022 has been slightly weaker. But if you look at the range, it's, 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 it's pretty wide. For example, Bangladesh and Pakistan are not down significantly. But she thought someone like a Sri Lanka is down almost 65%. Uh, but having said that, we underweight Sri Lanka because we're an active manager. So our weight to Sri Lanka is less than 3% right now. Uh, moving on. So next couple of slides, slides are probably just, I won't spend too much time because I think we already know and aware as to what's actually happened over the last couple of months because of the war in Ukraine and uh, in general, the higher commodity prices uh, that has led to. So if you look at this chart, I mean, crude oil price, uh, coking coal, natural gas, all the raw materials required for, for you know, power purposes or, or, or consumption purposes has increased significantly. And that's almost also led to high inflation, which I'll talk about later. And of course, more importantly, the food prices have increased pretty much across the board. And that's affecting almost all the countries globally, especially in the developing world. And that's why you've seen some kind of unrest or protest in South America, in other parts of Asia, like Indonesia, Sri Lanka, and Pakistan. Uh, and also, like I mentioned, inflation has picked up and it's not just a phenomenon in say the US or the EU or, or Pakistan or Kazakhstan or Sri Lanka. It's basically, if you look at the red line, which is the bottom uh, on the center of the chart, it's basically, if you look at world inflation, it's 
almost more than doubled in the last 18 odd months. So it's picked up significantly across the board. And I guess that's a bit of a concern for the markets right now. And given what's going on globally, especially with inflation, the US being at what 40 year highs over the last couple of months, uh, I think the Fed obviously over the last couple of weeks has become quite aggressive in its comments and very hawkish in its comments. And now there's talk about uh, the Fed raising uh, rates by not just 25 basis points in the next couple of meetings, but about 50 basis points in every meeting, I think for the next two or three uh, monet monetary policy meetings. But let's see how that goes. But basically the markets are factoring in much higher interest rates at least for the next uh, probably nine to 12 months. Uh, but I think this is all, 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 all quite well known if you are an informed investor and you read the financial press on, on a regular basis. But I think the bigger question is how, 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 how is our universe responding to these external events or these external headwinds? So coming to interest rates and in general inflation, if you look at the, you know, the central banks in our universe, they have been in fact very aggressive in raising interest rates uh, Sri Lanka, uh, as the chart shows you, has raised interest rates by 900 basis points since the second half of, of last year. Of course, they are, in a, they are in a different situation. They have to raise interest rates given their precarious uh, macroeconomic position. Uh, but also Pakistan, which is in a bit of a not, uh, I would say, a bit of a uh, not as bad a situation as Sri Lanka, but they've been pretty aggressive as well. They've, they've raised interest rates for more than 500 basis points. And Kazakhstan, which actually has a pretty strong macro environment in terms of their foreign exchange reserves, uh, the low debt to GDP, et cetera. They raise interest rates by 500 basis points and Georgia also uh, raised rates by almost 200 basis points. So it's, it's been pretty aggressive across the board. Uh, and many central banks in, in emerging markets in Asia actually have not even raised interest rates yet. I mean, India has not raised interest rates, Thailand, Indonesia, Philippines, all the major ASEAN countries barring Singapore have not raised interest rates so far. So I think uh, if you take a more longer term view, when I say longer term, I would not say one or two months, I would say more nine to 12 months. I think there's a high probability or high chance that if things settle down with the Russia-Ukraine conflict uh, in terms of a compromise or something of that sort, then I think central banks in our universe will be the first to cut because they were the first to raise and raise very aggressively. So I think you'll see them cutting interest rates. I would not be surprised if a country like Pakistan starts cutting interest rates by end of this year or beginning of next year. And that will be a big positive for our stock markets. Uh, and also another question we get with respect to the, from investors, especially with respect to, with what the Fed getting aggressive and raising rates pretty aggressively, what that, how, how will that impact our markets given the fact that you had taper tantrum in 2018 and also 2000, 2013. But as this chart shows you, if you look at the chart on the top left of the, of the, of the, of the, of the slide, uh, basically, this shows you the net foreign outflows from the key frontier markets in the universe like Bangladesh, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka. It's basically negative pretty much every year since 2017, uh, and especially picked up a lot of 2020, 2021. Uh, so most of the, in fact, just to digress a bit, frontier markets as an asset class is completely under owned right now. Foreigners have been at sellers, not just in Asian frontier markets, but across the global frontier market asset class, including South America, Africa, and Latin America. So it's not a Asian frontier market phenomenon, but that's pretty much a phenomenon which is uh, uh, across the board. And, and therefore, I don't see, you know, the Fed raises rates by seven times or eight times. Yes, that, that's an overhang on sentiment, but you're not going to see those outflows like you saw the last couple of years because there are not many foreign investors left in our markets. And I, I didn't even put the numbers for 2022 because I think most of the foreigners are already sold and the numbers for 2020 are still very low, for example, less than $10 million. So it doesn't really... I didn't even put those numbers in here because they didn't really match up to what's happened previously. And even Vietnam with the chart on the top right shows you a great story, great macro story, one of the best stories out there globally in the emerging markets or frontier market space. But uh, you've seen foreign outflows across the board uh, over the last couple of years, despite it being a good story. So that's what's happening in our markets. So I'm not so concerned about capital flight uh, in, in our markets from, from, from what the Fed does. Yes, it's an overhang, but I'm not concerned that Foreigners will sell, you know, billions of dollars or millions of dollars of uh, of, of equities, and the markets will get hit, because front, the markets in our universe actually are dominated by retail investors and domestic investors, and they've come in heavily into our market over the last couple of years. Uh, and I think what what I'm more concerned about is, or I guess what the market will be more concerned about is the higher commodity prices and how it impacts our universe, especially higher crude oil and petroleum prices because many countries in our universe actually in this part of the world in Asia are, are importing uh, crude oil and petroleum products. 
Uh, and from within our universe, I would say the two countries which are most exposed are Pakistan and Sri Lanka, uh, because they import at least 25, almost 25% of their imports are crude oil and petroleum products. And given where the oil price has been over the last couple of months, uh, and given the fact that they have already had widening current account deficits, they, they're in a bit of a tough position right now. Uh, and then here again, I would like to reiterate that that's where the active management comes in. We've been basically underweight Sri Lanka for the last more than a year, and in Pakistan also our weight is very low. On the, on the other end of the spectrum, you have countries which actually benefit from uh, higher commodity prices in our universe. Uh, Mongolia benefits a lot, and that's why the stock market did very well last year. Both Iraq and Kazakhstan also benefit a lot from higher oil prices, given that the majority of their exports is oil products. And of course, Iraq, the stock market is actually up this year because of the fact, because they're benefiting a lot from the high oil prices, uh, as Ahmad will explain to you later on in his slides. Uh, and also the other important part of the, the, the war, of the besides the Fed and what's happening commodity prices with, with respect to the war in Ukraine, uh, because we invest in Central Asia, we've got a lot of questions as to how the war in Ukraine affects Central Asia, because Central Asia not only shares a, a geographical border with Russia and Ukraine, but also they have close political or uh, cultural ties. You know, there's remittances coming in, there's a lot of trade happening between Central Asia and Russia and also Ukraine. But if you look at this chart, if you look at the currencies, this is the currency chart for, for some of the, some of the larger Central Asian countries. Uh, of course, the, the currencies had a bit of a knee-jerk reaction when the war began. So uh, until the second week of February, but if you, if you look at the, for the past say three or four weeks, the currencies have recovered. So sentiment has kind of recovered. It's not as bad as it, what it was when the war began, when the conflict began. In fact, the Georgian Lari uh, has actually appreciated this year, uh, despite Georgia, at least at the initial uh, time when the, when the conflict began, there were a lot of concerns about Georgia's economy and how, how to get impacted. But I think it's come out pretty strong. The currency is appreciated. And even the uh, Uzbek Som and Kazakh Tenge have hardly depreciated too much. I mean, 3 and 4% is not significant in the scheme of things. Uh, at the same time, yes, there, there will be short-term ramifications on the economy. But I think there are some longer-term longer -term trends playing out uh, from the conflict in, in, in Ukraine, which is actually going to be which is actually going to benefit Central Asia, in my view. If you look at the chart, if you look at the chart on the top left, if you look at this is Georgia's tourism sector and the tourism revenues for the last couple of years or, or last one year. Uh, and if you look at the, the extreme right column or right bar, which shows you the March 2022 revenues, there was a big spike. And that's basically because of a lot of long-term Russian and Ukrainian residents, well, not fleeing, but moving to other friendly countries or nearby countries like Georgia and Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan. And so Georgia is actually benefiting from this in a way indirectly. Uh, through higher tourism revenues and their tourism revenues are now back to, you know, almost 70, 75% of uh, pre-pandemic levels. And also as the chart on the right shows you, uh, you know, uh, in Tbilisi, which is the capital of Georgia, Air, Airbnb rental occupancies or demand is almost 100% of, of 2019 levels or pre-pandemic levels. So there's a lot of long-term demand from especially Russian uh, long-term visitors or long-term tourists who want to move to some other countries. Uh, for safety or for the fact that they can use bank accounts freely and use their credit cards freely and travel freely. Uh, and also I think a bigger trend is uh, the second uh, point which is mentioned in the, in the bottom of the presentation is Ural Motorcycles. They're actually shifting their production from Russia to Kazakhstan. I think that's a pretty big company in Russia. And that's a pretty big trend. I think what you saw when the, when the trade war began in 2018 between China and the US, you saw a lot of... Uh, uh, investment going out of China from Chinese companies as well as companies operating in the manufacturing sector in China, and they're moving to Vietnam and Bangladesh. I think you'll see a similar thing happening in Central Asia. Of course, uh, uh, the amount of manufacturing happening happening in Russia is obviously not as much as China, given the scale. Uh, but uh, you know, the economy of Central Asia are not significantly large either. For example, Uzbekistan and Georgia and Kazakhstan, they can all benefit from this investment that's coming in over the next couple of months, if if and when it does come in. And also some of the large consulting companies from Moscow, I mean, global, consul global consulting companies, which had offices in Moscow, they shifted their staff to Almaty in Kazakhstan. Uh, and also, as I mentioned, Uzbekistan also is seeing longer term arrivals from both Russia and Ukraine. So I think there you go, you're going to see some benefits from this, actually, not really uh, negative impacts from the conflict in Ukraine. And the other kind of uh, indirect benefit is the fact that, as I, th I think pretty much all of us will be aware that Russia and uh, Actually, especially Russia was a large producer of food products and also raw materials 
which are meant for fertilizer production like potassium and, and, and phosphate. So as the chart on the top left shows you, uh, both Russia and Belarus account for almost 40% of global potash production. And that's, well, not out of the system, but it's going to be difficult to supply your clients uh, with Russian or Belarus potash, at least in the near term. Uh, and also on the chart as the, on the top right uh, shows you, uh, Russia also is a large phosphate producer. In fact, Fosagro is the third largest uh, phosphate producer globally. And I think, and over here as well, other countries and companies which produce these products and are not affected by sanctions or have, you know, have close relations with uh, many clients that Russia and Belarus, Belarus are supplying to uh, will benefit. So over here, we actually initiated investments in Jordan just last month uh, because Jordan actually has two companies, both one in phosphate and one in potash, which are amongst the largest globally. Uh, and uh, they were trading at very cheap multiples. And, and, and the conflict has completely changed the dynamics for this company and also for the sector. I think in 2020, the potash industry was in more supply, uh, but now given the weather prices are and given the weather demand is going to be, you're going to see these companies do quite well. Actually, uh, Jordan Phosphate Mines, as the, as the, you know, as the point uh, at the bottom of the, of the presentation shows you, they just declared the first quarter results yesterday and net profits grew by three times year over year. So both these companies are going to have a standout here. They're going to make they're going to make pretty much a killing in 2022, uh, similar to what you know some of these uh, pandemic benefit pan pandemic beneficiaries like Zoom. They showed significant increase in profits 2020. I think these companies will show a significant increase in profits this year, and we, we should benefit from their stock price appreciation, uh, which has happened in the last couple of months. And this is just a chart showing how the phosphate and potash prices moved, uh, especially if you look at towards the end of the line uh, post-war, uh, there's been a, a, a spike in, in prices given the fact that a lot of supply is out of the system now. Uh, so that's, that's, that's basically the impact and how it's impacting our markets in terms of uh, geopolitics, uh, the economy, the crude oil, and the macroeconomic impact. Uh, but I think there are some longer term trends, which I think in my view are conflict agnostic or Fed agnostic, you know, these, these headwinds will be there, this noise will be there, but some long-term structural trends will still play out, and I'm pretty confident they'll play out because uh, you know it's, it's you, you can see the numbers. The numbers speak for themselves. If you look at the chart on the top left, this shows you the market share for garment exporters globally uh, in the last probably decade. Uh, China's market share obviously has come down, and the two countries which have gained are Vietnam and Bangladesh, not India, not Indonesia, not Turkey, not some other you know large. Uh, no, not, no other, no, no, not a country, not country from some other, from, from some other continent. So basically, Vietnam and Bangladesh have really gained market share. Bangladesh has become the second biggest garment exporter globally now, uh, after China. And also, the chart on the top right shows you uh, Vietnam is only becoming more and more important for global brands or global companies as a manufacturing base. I mean, these names are all well known, well, uh, well established brands. And if you, if, if I show, if I looked, I could, I don't think, I don't think I could have shown you this chart even four years ago or five years ago, this has all happened in the last three, probably two and a half, three years, where a lot of production has shifted into Vietnam. Uh, and just, just elaborating on this point, if you look at the chart on the top left, the export growth from, from both Bangladesh and Vietnam is structural. It's not a one-off because people want to shift, you know, uh, manufacturing activities from China or some high cost locations. It's a long-term trend, 15 year cumulative growth for Bangladesh garment exports is almost 10% and for Vietnam's total exports, Growth, about, growth is about 15%. So this is, these are numbers which not many countries in, in even uh, some of the larger exporters in ASEAN region, which have been done, which have done well in the past, they can't boast of such, boast of such numbers now. And if you look at the chart on the top right, uh, Bangladesh's export growth is just booming now. Uh, it's basically picked up because uh, of, again, like I said earlier, a lot, a lot of the production has shifted into uh, from China from China into Vietnam, and they also have lower wages. But over the last two quarters, Bangladesh, Bangladesh's exports have grown by more than 40%. Uh, I don't think it, many countries are doing this kind of export growth, especially in the last six or seven months. So both countries, I think, are structural stories, and especially the export sector, you'll see this growth continuing for probably for the next five or six years. Uh, another trend is the, uh, the, the cashless transactions in a market have picked up. So I'll just touch upon this very quickly, is the fact that because of changes in consumer behavior, you've seen... Uh, cashless transactions or digital payments pick up and Bangladesh's digital payments as a whole has gone from about $4 billion about three years ago to more than $8 billion a month. So it's almost, uh, it's doubled basically in, in the span of about three years. 
and you'll see some kind of new listings coming up in our markets over the next couple of years in the fintech space. Uh, structurally as well, I would say GDP growth in our markets will be very strong. Uh, these are the IMF estimates for the next five years on average. And this is this, this is after downgrades were done last week by the IMF. So despite that, Asian frontier markets will show about 4.6% GDP growth on average for our universe, which is much higher than say Latin America or Middle East or emerging Europe. So this growth is here to stay. And like I said, the numbers speak for themselves. And just to take this point further, there's two countries which really stand out in terms of GDP growth, which is driving GDP growth in our markets. As, as again, Bangladesh and Vietnam, the, the growth over here is structural. They have very strong demographics or attractive demographics. They're benefiting, benefiting from export growth and also in infrastructure investments. So both countries will show almost 7% GDP growth uh, over the next five years on average. And this is again after the IMF cut their estimates. Maybe IMF cuts, cuts estimates again in October this year, uh, but they only cut Bangladesh by about 30, I think 30 or 40 bips. So I'm not so concerned. It's not going to go from 7% to 4.5%. So the growth will still be, you know, plus six percent for the next couple of years, which is very, very positive actually. Uh, so how does this play into our strategy? So I think, given what's going on globally, many of these factors are pretty much external: the conflict in Ukraine, the high commodity prices, the high inflation, the talk from the Fed, high interest rates. These are all external factors. So I guess the way to look at it, it comes down to being relative, right? I mean, which countries can manage this kind of this, these external headwinds in a better fashion? Uh, and from our universe, I think these four countries on the chart, they really stand out because of the fact that they got their macro right. You know, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Vietnam, Bangladesh, they've got low debt to GDP, high foreign exchange reserves. They've got the, especially Bangladesh and Pakistan have got the higher exports, higher exports. Kazakhstan's got commodity exports, Uzbekistan's got reforms. So they really stand out compared to say Pakistan or Sri Lanka or countries with higher debt levels. And also on a bottom up basis, uh, again, here, like uh, we mentioned this in our in our review and outlook in, in December as well, that we focus on quality companies and quality countries. And on bottom up basis as well, we focus basically on large caps over the last maybe six or nine months. And if you look at the valuations of these large caps, these are blue chip companies in their countries, very well known brands, and trading at you know sub 10p multiples uh, with pretty decent growth rates. And even for the you know, for the com companies with a multiple of more than 15 times, trading at 20 times. The growth rates are pretty, pretty, pretty impressive. So we are focusing on quality both on the country level and also on a company level. And again, the valuations for our fund and also for the markets that we invest in is, is, is quite very attractive. So the fund reflects the valuation of the stocks that we, that we invest in. The fund, our AFC Asia Frontier Fund trades are only nine times. It's way off its peak, which was 17 times in 2017. And yeah, we enter the year at pretty attractive valuation. So I'm not so concerned that tomorrow there's like a 10% correction globally you know, we are not, we are not, our fund doesn't trade at 25 times, or we are not, we are not invested in, you know, the, uh, the the big tech names in, in ASEAN or, or South Asia, which are correcting, which are correcting a lot. We have been investing in, in, you know, pretty much old economy stocks, cash flow, strong balance sheets, strong brands. Uh, and just to take this point further, is the fact that I spoke to you about the low valuations, but if you look at the, on the, 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 the top table and the extreme right, of the table, our, the earnings, cumulative earnings growth for our companies is about 18%. So these are companies which make profits and they grow. Uh, and this is despite what's happened during the pandemic. And of course, now with the war in Ukraine, you still have time for those earnings impacts to come in. But on a historical level, they've done pretty well. And even our volatility for our fund is still quite low. It's about 10.5%, which reflects the low correlation of Asian frontier markets against global markets. And just to wrap up, this is just a country allocation uh, what I would end with saying is that when the pandemic happened in 2000, in March 2020, and global markets were impacted, one year from the pandemic, the AFC Asia Frontier Fund, you know, the returns between March 2021 to March 2020 was about 40 percent. So what I'm trying to say is that, you know, despite what happens globally, there could be some headwinds. Uh, these markets usually come back pretty strong. So I'm not so concerned that you know if there's come some correction in even the next coming in the next coming few months because of what the Fed does or because of the war in Ukraine. I think these markets will come back pretty strongly uh, if you if you take take a long term view. So that's how I would like to end. Uh, and uh, I'm pretty positive in the long term for the for for this for the EFC Asia Frontier Fund and also for the Asian Frontier Markets. I will now hand over to Ahmed, who will talk about the EFC Iraq Fund. Over to you, Ahmed. Thank you, Usher, and uh, hello all, and uh, thank you all for joining in. Um, as uh, Next slide, please, if I may. 
as uh, my colleague Rusha said earlier, and Thomas also, almost like the year began with almost a perfect storm. The way I look at it, it's almost uh, 2022 is almost a replay of 2020, but without the uh, without the good news. So, for instance, um, unlike unlike then, central banks are tightening. Unlike then, uh, governments have no fiscal room to ease the crisis at the time, as we all are aware, uh, there was an incredible support from the governments. And also consumers had a bit of room. This year is almost the reverse, as you can see, uh, no fiscal space. Food and energy prices are all um, hurting the consumer and obviously hurting consumption uh, in almost all parts of the world. Now, this is the perfect storm, but in a way for Iraq, a lot of these things are in reverse. In a sense, it's almost like a good perfect storm for Iraq, which is, um, um, you know, which, which explains why we have the performance difference in the fund versus other, um, other markets. Now, uh, as, as you'll see in the next, in, in the next couple of slides, what, I, what I'll show is basically Iraq has been through a near-death experience and the, in 2020 uh, when all the negative forces hit it quite badly and it began the recovery from actually the year end which, which uh, came in, in line with the markets uh, at near around December time frame. As you can see, um, all prices are incredibly positive for Iraq as you can see the chart on the uh, top right hand corner. Now that shows you uh, all price expectations. Uh, last year when we wrote the uh, output for 2020, we were basing 2022, we were basing it on the lower uh, line, which as you can see the gray line. Since then, um, expectations have shot up. They eased down quite a bit because obviously we will have a slower world economy going forward. Um, from the growth inhibiting factors from high oil price and high food prices. Uh, but nevertheless, this for Iraq translates into an enormous bounty. As you can see the bottom uh, chart on bottom right hand chart, which shows the um, monthly oil sales uh, for the government. You can see the hitting record levels. Um, I will point out to you, compare this period to what we had the golden period between 2011 and 2014. And I'll show that in the uh, next uh, slide. Now, in here, by the way, unlike most other governments, Iraq has an enormous fiscal space uh, to support its population, unlike other countries. So with current oil prices, we're expecting for 2022, the government would have something like $117 billion in revenues. That versus last year's expenditures, which were expansionary of $75 billion. Government's considering a $17 billion food emergency. This is almost like what in terms of a shot in the arm for the economy, and almost in terms of what you've seen in the developed world in uh, 2020. That's, I think, what differentiates Iraq this time and what enables ultimately consumption. Um, also, likely uh, outlook for oil prices over the next two or three years. Okay, currently there is still a bit of fear built into them, but I believe the changed uh, global world means uh, that for at least the next five years, we will see much higher demand for oil, partly for countries to lessen dependence on Russia, as well as to increase storage, to avoid further shocks. And obviously there is at some stage in the back of more people's minds, at some stage down the line, some sort of conflict, not necessarily war, but some sort of conflict um, um, with China. And therefore, I think the, the mentality to hoard oil will be there at least for five years. That will be transformational for Iraq and for the governments, because basically they will pursue expansionary policies in this environment that will translate into a consumption, which is all great for the stocks that we own. We own banks, we own consumer um, uh, uh, spending stocks, and we own telecom, which are all direct beneficiaries of that. Next slide, uh, please. Now, what makes it Iraq super attractive, uh, in addition to what I gave you earlier in terms of fundamentals, which they've never been better, is the fact that the market has been in a brutal bear market over the last few years. Um, you can compare that in the first chart, uh, the, um, uh, the, on, on the right hand side on the top versus the bottom chart compared to other markets. And you can see other markets are going to deal with a vastly different world. Iraq is on the reverse, it's emerging from uh, a massive uh, uh, correction, uh, bear market, as well as the market is extremely under owned. And in fact, Iraq, as I would imagine, is the most under owned market uh, of all times, but from locals as well as uh, internationals. Now, um, almost to wrap it up, I'm just uh, uh, aware of time, is that yes, it's very attractive versus other markets. Uh, currently for the month of April, we are down um, uh, 7.2 for the index while 8.3 down for us. But nevertheless, that came in after a very strong uh, few months performance in which the market was up about 28%. So between Ramadan and the market correction, in, in my mind, that explains 
the decline and what makes Iraq very, very attractive. And you can imagine even now, even at the end of uh, last month, the market, uh, sorry, the end of now, the last, uh, the uh, market is down still 58% from the all time high. Um, if you remember the prior chart, I mentioned the all time high, as you can see the market in uh, between 2011 and uh, 2015, when, when, when the ISIS crisis was hit most, the market almost was up double. And I think we can see that again because the government now has enough money to spend on salaries, pensions, and drive consumption, as well as investment spending, which the country desperately needs. So the way I end up with is fundamentally Iraq looks very attractive, but at the same time, you have a market emerging from a, a bear so far powerful fundamentals, just as the market emerges uh, from uh, a massive decline, as well as this is just technically a word it looks like. Now, it doesn't even take into account the long-term secular story. So everything I told you right now is only the short-term fundamentals of the next few years, which are attractive, but that leaves alone the market come emerging from a four decades of conflict and the huge investment spending that is going to be possible given where oil prices are right now. So with that, I thank you very much, and I'll leave it to my colleague, Scott. Over to you, Scott. Thank you, Ahmed. Uh, so to start with, um, we have some good news regarding Uzmet Kamenat, the fund's largest holding. Um, the dividend issue is now sorted, and the stock is adjusted. So we will be reporting an NAV um, this month. And for the, month of, or for the months of March and April, we estimate that we were up 1.7% which translates to roughly 101% uh, performance since the inception of the fund. And since uh, February, the, the price of Uzmet Kambanat is also up 40%. So it's back to business as usual in that regard, which we're excited about. Next slide, please. So Uzbekistan, when we first came here in 2018, what attracted us so much about it is that it was really, it seemed to us like a, another Vietnam, of course, minus the ocean. It has the well, it's the manufacturing powerhouse of the region. It has the largest industrial base. Um, it, it's the horticultural breadbasket of the region. It has a large population, the largest in Central Asia of 35 million. Um, it's very under leveraged, which is very exciting this day and age. Few countries are, uh, both at the, the sovereign to a degree, but certainly corporates and, and individuals because the cost of capital here is 25 to 30%. And, and keep in mind that if you're borrowing from a bank, you're borrowing capital and providing 125% collateral. So we imagine that as you look out over the next say five to seven years, as the cost of capital comes down, as investment comes into the country and the broader region, that Uzbekistan is really set up for, for a golden period. Um, but if you look at what has happened over the past few years, is you see rising protectionism, rising resource nationalism, redundancies in supply chains, um, also with yeah, I, what I think is the the onset of a um, an energy crisis and a food crisis, which will probably be around for quite a while. I, I think that Uzbekistan is really well positioned because they've done what every other country is in the process of at least looking to start doing, which is uh, increasing protectionism, increasing to a degree resource nationalism. And Uzbekistan over the past 30 years has is a result of import substitution and semi-protectionist policies really gone through all of this. And the fact that it has cheap energy, um, it, it's, it puts it, I think, in, in sort of pole position among a lot of countries in the region. Um, and for example, 93% you know, of the country's uh, protein consumption is actually produced domestically. Of course, the majority of the grains are imported, but the government is actually seeing a decrease in cotton planting, and they're trying to increase the, uh, the planting of soy and whatnot to offset that. But fertilizers, of which we have a, a global sort of shortage of now, courtesy of high energy inputs and the issue in you know, Russia and Ukraine, um, Uzbekistan is an exporter of, of fertilizers. So we're really bullish on the, the environment that we have today in Uzbekistan in um, sort of the auspices of a, a global economy that is uh, increasingly volatile is a result of uh, rising, steadily rising commodity prices. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so how do we benefit <clears throat> if the stock is, the stock exchange is still very nascent. Its market cap is roughly six billion dollars. Um, and the question that we ask ourselves and have asked ourselves since we started investing here was, how does the market go from say six billion today to a hundred billion in the next five to ten years? 
And as we've talked about many times in our newsletters, it's going to be, firstly, we think with the privatization of SOEs, of which the government has a plan to privatize 14 of them through the stock exchange over the next two or three years, of which several of them will then thereafter see dual listings likely in London. Um, and these 14 companies include banks, insurance companies, mining companies, um, uh, basically the crown jewels of the, of the economy. And, and this year, the plan is to privatize three companies, Uzmet Combinat, which is the fund's largest holding, uh, of which the government owns about 80%. So they're planning to privatize roughly 5% through the stock exchange. Uzavto, the, sta uh, the state-owned car manufacturer, and then Almalik, which is one of the biggest copper and gold mines in the world, which is 100% state-owned, which we're very excited about being privatized. Um, so, you know, it, we think that as you start to see these state-owned privatizations in due course, private companies will begin to at least consider um, IPOing on the market in order to, to source alternative financing if they're not borrowing from the banks. And we're actually already starting to see a handful of, of private companies uh, exploring potential IPO, which is exciting to us because the, the thesis for this was initially further out, but it seems to be actually being brought forward. Um, and one of the big challenges in the market has always been liquidity, market depth, market participation. And one of the big inhibitors to this, um, even though it's certainly changing, especially the mindset domestically, but it's for a foreigner specifically, how do you open a brokerage account in this country? It is a phenomenally bureaucratic country. Um, former Soviet satellite, pre-frontier market, um, there's a lot of red tape, but the government knows there's a lot of red tape and they're trying to digitize the economy to the best of their ability and eliminate as much red tape as possible. So in the second half of this year, most likely a new capital markets uh, legislation is going to be passed, which will sort of increase the well, it'll bring the legislation up to more international standards. It'll further strengthen minority shareholder protections. But one of the things we're most excited about in this regard is the fact that the, the process of opening a brokerage account is going to be digitized uh, for foreigners and locals. And, and the way the process works now is if you're a foreigner, a corporate or individual as you fill out your account forms, get an apostille or notarization, send them to Uzbekistan, get them translated into Russian, that is all going to go away. That friction is all going to disappear. And I was actually speaking with a potential investor today talking about this issue is that if you come here, it takes five minutes to open a brokerage account. But if you're abroad, th there's a challenge there. So uh, the on-ramps are going to, or the on-ramp to the stock exchange looks like it will become much easier uh, over the coming months, which we're excited about. And, and as a result, um, you know, new investor participants or new market participants should help to increase liquidity, but also uh, increase the odds of these state-owned privatizations being more successful. So we still think it's very early days in the market, um, and, and there's a lot more room to run in the country. Again, it, the semi-protectionist policies I'm actually really excited about. They have cheap energy. Uh, it's a diversified economy. And you know, for those that think they might have missed the opportunity, really, I think we're just getting started, even though the funds performed well. You know, is of, uh, is of February, the fund PE was only 5.7 times. So um, still very optimistic on the future. And with that, I'll hand it over to Andy Vogelsonger, who will be talking about Vietnam. OK. Hello, and good evening, or good morning. Uh, April, what a difficult month that was. The VN index dropped by 8.4%. Uh, sorry, Yuruchi, can you go to the next slide? The VN index dropped by 8.4% in April, bringing the year-to-date performance to minus 8.8%. <clears throat> Until the end of March, we did extremely well and we're almost up 6% for the year and clearly outperformed the index and most, if not all, of our peers. But unfortunately, our portfolio also suffered in this correction, and the NAV declined by 5.9% in April, uh, which brings our year-to-date performance to minus 0.9% according to internal estimates. The NAV, the official NAV numbers are out in, uh, in about five days. The reason for April's correction in the Vietnamese stock market is several fold. On one hand, the stock market held up impressively well over the past few months, despite global volatility. 
but the short term sentiment started turning negative at the beginning of the months due to increased inflation pressure and hence higher interest rate expectations. And the ongoing investigations of manipulation in the real estate and stock markets didn't really help. All this led to a sell-off, which triggered many margin calls, accelerating the decline, and hence pushed the indices sharply lower. The Fund Ec Vietnam ETF, for example, now shows a negative, negative return of over minus 20% year to date. Next slide, please. From a technical angle, it looks like this correction could come to an end, given the strong support levels. For the first time in two years, the RSI, the Relative Strength Index, which you see, uh, which you have seen on the bottom of the, of the previous chart, shows an oversold condition. After many inexperienced investors had to sell their highly leveraged positions. Also, the valuation with a P of around 15 times now looks very attractive, combined with the latest upbeat GDP forecasts from the IMF of around 6% for 2022, despite the current turmoil, and 7.2% for 2023. Also, the 2022 inflation forecast is moderate at 3.8% and 3.2% for 2023. The average earnings growth of listed companies in Vietnam is expected to be around 20% in 2022, which would bring the forward P of the VN index to a very attractive 12 times. And on a trailing basis, the VN index is trading on its lower band for the past six years. As we mentioned in our previous reports, we believe that the insurance sector will benefit in a rising interest rate environment. And year to date, this sector outperformed the VN index by over 14%. Given our positive view, the AFC Vietnam Fund has an exposure of around 25% to the, to the insurance sector. But we also have a positive outlook for seafood and garment sectors. The seafood sector in Vietnam benefited from strong demand out of Europe, triggered by EU sanctions on Russian goods, including seafood, such as catfish and shrimps. Given that Vietnam had a free trade agreement in place with Europe since late 2020, some companies in Vietnam are significantly benefiting from this increased European demand. China's zero COVID policy forced many garment factories in China to shut, shut down completely or to reduce production capacity. Due to Vietnam's more liberal COVID policy, ongoing uh, opening up its economy completely, many garment orders were redirected from China to Vietnam. Given that Chinese garment industry is much bigger than, than in Vietnam, it only needs a small shift in production from China to Vietnam in order to make a significant impact. Often large brands such as, for example, Nike or Adidas have production facilities in both countries, and they can easily shift part of their production from one country to the other. Next slide, please. On this slide, you can see the performance of the AFC Vietnam Fund versus the VN index as of March 2022, which was the latest official NAV numbers available. Our performance um, since inception was 200 plus 273%, which brings us to an analyzed return of around 17.3% per annum. The sharp ratio with 1.2%, uh, sorry, 1.2 means that we didn't take excessive risk in order to achieve this performance. The PE ratio, 11.9 times versus a market average of around 15 times is obviously quite attractive. And the price book ratio of 1.9 times and a very chunky dividend yield of around 3.4%. As a result of the relaxing COVID restrictions in Southeast Asia, there's a huge surge in travel bookings and a surge in prices across the region. Vietnam's long weekend to celebrate Reunification Day on tomorrow on April 30th and Labor Day on the 1st of May have seen domestic tourism destinations become fully booked. 
Also, when you look at Ho Chi Minh, life is definitely back with buzzing street life. Streets are full of people, jammed with cars and motorbikes, and the coffees and restaurants are lively again. I believe the sharp correction in April offers a great buying opportunity for Vietnam, given that the macroeconomic picture for Vietnam is still intact and the outlook is rather bright with GDP growth forecasts between six to 8% for the next five to 10 years. Please feel free to contact me directly should you wish to discuss Vietnam in more details. My email address is av at asiafrontiercapital.com. Thank you very much for listening, and I pass over to Thomas. Thanks, everybody, for your interesting in and insightful presentations. We will go now to answer some of the questions we have already received from the audience, but you can still submit more questions during this Q&A session. So one, the first question we actually received was, uh, was also first in the chat. So please use the Q&A uh, function and not the chat uh, box. Uh, it was, and this is for Ruchir, what's your observation on the impact of the external factors on Bangladesh uh, economy or macroeconomy like uh, exchange rate, inflation, and uh, balance of payment deficit? Yeah, thanks, Thomas. So in, with respect to Bangladesh, I think I think you need to differentiate Bangladesh between Pakistan and Sri Lanka and some of the other countries in the region. Uh, they went into the into the pandemic and also into 2022 on a pretty strong economic footing in terms of like a, I showed one of my slides, the debt to GDP ratio for Bangladesh is I think less than 40%. Uh, they had about eight or nine months of import cover at the end of 2021 before the commodity price spike. Uh, so they don't they don't they they were never in a situation where they had a balance of payment crisis, et cetera. So they, they are pretty, they, they went into 2022 on a pretty strong footing. But yes, I mean, they, they import commodities, they import crude oil. Uh, so you've seen the current account deficit increase. Uh, and at the same time, they have not let the currency depreciate. So I would say in my view, they should let the currency depreciate a bit. But from a currency perspective, you are not gonna see, you know, the currency depreciate by 50% like what you see in Sri Lanka or like what you saw in Pakistan in 2018. Uh, maybe you'll see, for example, the current official currency rate, if you go on to Bloomberg is about 86 um, taka to the dollar. And uh, the unofficial rate is slightly seven or 8% uh, more expensive. Uh, so so that, so that you'll see probably a gradual depreciation over the next couple of year, couple of, uh, maybe couple of months. And also on the inflation, the inflation is 6%, uh, mainly led by food inflation. So it's nowhere close to, the inflation levels that you're seeing in Pakistan, which is about more than 12%, and definitely not uh, like Sri Lanka, which is more than 20%. So Bangladesh, in my view, is a structurally strong story. Yes, like I mentioned, uh, what's happening globally is affecting not just Bangladesh, it's affecting everyone, and therefore it becomes relative which countries can handle this better. And in my view, Bangladesh in the long term, more than a couple of quarters, can handle this much better uh, than, say, a Sri Lanka or Pakistan or some of the other weaker countries in Africa or Eastern Europe. Okay, great. Uh, then another question also for you, Ruchir. Uh, what about Myanmar uh, is a question. So what's our view on Myanmar? Uh, yeah, it's disappointing. Well, I mean, <laughs> well, I'm not much of a view, to Bad. be honest. Uh, we don't have much exposure to Myanmar, given what's happened in uh, February 2021. Uh, and, you know, the sanctions and in general, I mean, the economies uh, went went off a cliff last year, and I guess they're not much of a recovery this year as well. So as long as the way the situation is, I don't see us investing in Myanmar further, unless we see something changing on the ground in terms of some political reform, which seems unlikely. Uh, so yeah, I will leave it at that. I don't think uh, that's a story to worth following, at least in the near term. I would focus more on the markets that you know I, I spoke about in terms of Bangladesh, uh, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Vietnam. So Myanmar is not really on our radar at this point in time. Unfortunately, yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, as I said, sad story. And yeah, that's what it happens sometimes. But having said that, every dog has its day. So maybe the stock suddenly can uh, rebound, but you need to have patience. It can take many, many years. 
Okay, then uh, one or two questions regarding uh, Uzbekistan. This is obviously for uh, Scott. Uh, many Russians are fleeing the country, uh, mainly with destination Uzbekistan. Those people are mostly well educated. Are those seen as chance and new input to Uzbek markets, or is it just some temporal uh, phenomenon? Thank you, Thomas. Uh, it's a mix. You're definitely seeing, well, well, I'll say this is that I have a friend that was here last weekend. He's from the UK. Took him three weeks to get a reservation at the Hyatt. Um, I have friends that used to come here before and they would book the day before the day they arrived. So the hotels are all full. Um, you have a mix of tourists, Russians, Belarusians, Ukrainians that are coming here that otherwise wouldn't have come here if it wasn't for the war. Um, so spending money, a lot of them are staying. So they're buying real estate. Um, some of them are moving tech companies here and whatnot. Some of them are getting involved in financial services. And then others have used Uzbekistan as a hop off point, spending a month here to get their visas and other things in order. And a lot of them have moved on to, as, as Rusher said, the places like Tbilisi, Georgia. Um, but certainly there's some stickiness here. And the government is implementing a three year uh, sort of investor business visa for people in the tech space to try and attract uh, tech talent. So it's definitely a net positive for the country. Okay, and on the other hand, it's also negative. It's for negative for our investor tour, uh, uh, our planned investor tour. We had to postpone uh, last year due to COVID in May. We had, we postponed it uh, this year. And we thought maybe we had the intention to do it in October. And now we have the situation that the hotels are full. So uh, it's very difficult to find a decent hotel for, uh, let's say, 20 people or so. Uh, and that's probably the target we have if we have another investor tour. So unfortunately, bad news. And then a follow-up question regarding Uzbekistan is, how is the situation in Russia affecting remittances into Uzbekistan? It, it had a, had a minor negative effect, but uh, a lot of Uzbeks are still there. You've also heard news locally of, let's say, 50,000 Uzbeks coming back. But the beauty of this country is that it's the heart of Central Asia, and it is a trading nation. Uzbeks uh, will find an opportunity you know, or, or die trying. So a lot of them are, say, relocating to places in the Middle East, Dubai, Abu Dhabi, um, you know, Doha, and Qatar. Um, so. Some of them have come back, of course, but a, a lot of them are also, they've either come to Uzbekistan and they've gone back to Russia or they're relocating to the third countries. So uh, long-term, I don't see it being much of a, a structural issue. Yeah. Then a uh, question for Andy about Vietnam. Uh, how do you do proper due diligence on Vietnamese stocks given how opaque operations can sometimes be? And I have to say here, actually, uh, Andy's may, uh, sub, uh, substituting uh, our Vietnam fund manager, which is uh, and he is currently in, I don't know, Da Nang or in Hanoi uh, at a uh, AGM, so attending a shareholders meeting, and that's part of it, of due diligence. So he's going to many, many shareholders meeting. Now it's shareholder meetings time, uh, um, March, April, and May. So he is visiting, uh, visiting, attending dozens of HMs, talking to other investors and talking especially to the management. But Andy, what do you have additional? Well, well, you know, this is a very good question. And uh, and of course, uh, corporate governance uh, should be at the top of the list uh, of all the risks as a fund manager you, you have to, to take care of. And uh, the way we do it in the AFC Vietnam Fund, we are very well diversified. So we don't take any concentrated risk in any stock just in order to avoid to fall into a trap where, where maybe uh, there, is, there is a balance sheet fraud or anything like this. But, uh, but I think the probably more important or, or equally important is to have people on the ground which, uh, which have connections, which, uh, which, which know the people, which know their backgrounds. Because like Vicente always says, you know, when he, when he does due diligence on companies, 
So we tend this our fund manager. He, he he says he looks at the at the past record of that of the CFO or the CEOs of the top uh, management, and uh, just to see if they have clean records. So if they ever have been in another company where they where they had maybe done uh, certain things which were not uh, not great in in terms of accounting, then uh, then he would definitely not invest in. In, in 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 such a company where where he couldn't trust the CFO or the CEO or to, in general the top management. So so yes, there, there's probably not the perfect recipe of, of how to avoid all uh, all, all basically uh, risks what, what you're facing, but but one of the risks, as we said, is to be well diversified when you invest in frontier markets in general. Uruchir, you want to add something to that? Yeah, in terms of due diligence, I think one question we've got a lot from clients once COVID, I mean, once the pandemic began is, okay, you guys just travel a lot and meet all the companies and now you cannot. So how do you know what's going on? Well, I think I've had more meetings now in the last 18 months than I did, uh, you know, traveling to Vietnam and the other countries as well, meeting companies because what the pandemic has done because of Zoom and all these online, uh, well, these meeting apps is the fact that many companies, even some of the mid-sized companies, uh, as well as some of the larger companies, which never used to have, you know, quarterly analyst meetings, they do quarterly analyst meetings now uh, every quarter. And uh, even many of the brokerage companies, they organize these investor conferences online. So you don't have to go to the country and you have many of these mid-sized companies, you know, coming on and in discussing about their companies. Uh, so it's, it's actually, uh, it's, it's been very, it's, it's, I've, in fact, I've not really had uh, any issue in terms of getting information on what's going on uh, from the companies because it's become quite easy to actually have access to them now. Yeah, especially in those companies we are investing in. Okay, then uh, another question is, uh, what is, are your picks in uh, Cambodia? We have well, actually, two. in Cambodia, we have two positions right now. Uh, one is uh, a gaming operator, which is, I guess, if you're if you're familiar with Cambodia, you would know which company I'm talking about. It's listed in Hong Kong, and uh, the other company is actually a gold miner. They just began production in Cambodia. It's actually listed in Australia, and they'll be doing uh, 100 million dollars in 100 million Australian dollars in net profits. Thomas, does that correct? I think that's what. That's what he goes. That's what I, if I'm mistaken. Yeah, something uh, between 100 and 140. I have imagined something. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah. so mm -hmm. basically becoming profitable now. And uh, it's based, I mean, it's listed in Australia, but they have the mine in Cambodia. So those are two investments. But from a local listing perspective, I guess, Thomas, uh, there's not much opportunity right now, or is there? I mean, from a local point of view, I mean, there are only seven or eight stocks. And the most interesting right now, uh, because we used to uh, invest in uh, Phnom Penh uh, ports, but it has gone up a lot uh, because of Chinese buying. The same with uh, Sihanoukville uh, port also went up a lot uh, behind uh, reasonable uh, valuation. So the only stock right now on our radar list is uh, Oklahoma Bank. So if it has some kind of stock overhang from uh, uh, previous shareholders, institutional shareholders, but also employees, if that is gone, then and certainly uh, could be uh, an interesting uh, uh, stock for the long term investment. But also, of course, the valuation has to be uh, right. Yeah. Okay, then here another question. Do uh, we're well, pretty soon finish. Uh, Question to Richard, some of the stocks listed in both Bangladesh and India, Mariko, Berger Pains, Linda, Unilever. Uh, yeah, so he says in, in India, the PEs are very high compared with Bangladesh. So what, what yeah. do you think about that? Okay, well, that's yeah, true. That's a good question, but that's not just a Bangladesh issue. I think that's pretty much across uh, our universe. I mean, many come, you know, for example, Bata India trades at a much higher multiple than Bata Pakistan. Colgate, Palmolive, of India trades at a much higher multiple than Colgate, Pakistan. I guess, I guess it comes down to having uh, one is a more active retail participation in the stock market, which I think is getting there in Bangladesh, but it's definitely not there in Pakistan right now. 
Uh, but coming back to specific to Bangladesh, yes, I think this, this, this discount will be there given, uh, you know, once there's more excitement or once, I guess, once, once foreign investors come back into frontier markets, especially Bangladesh, uh, and once when they can travel there, uh, the multiples could increase. But I think one important point is these, these counters in Bangladesh, like Berger Pains or Bata or uh, uh, Unilever, uh, Reckitt, they're not liquid at all, right? So you can't even buy shares. So it's very difficult for a foreign investor or any investor to basically get shares shares in these companies. I think in the Indian multinational companies are much more liquid and that's why they trade a high multiple. So I think if the government of Bangladesh can actually push these companies, I think they've tried before, uh, but if they can push these you know, multinational companies to list more shares on the exchange, I think that will really make these, stock, these stocks rally a lot. Uh, uh, and just to one one more point is uh, the you know the Berger's and the Rackets and the Unilevers in Bangladesh, they trade they though it's a discount to India, they trade a much higher multiple of the market, right? So India trades at twenty five times, and you know <clears throat> and Unilever India trades at fifty times, but Bangladesh trades at twelve times, uh, and uh, uh, Berger Bangladesh trades at about twenty five thirty times. So you've got to put, take that into consideration as well. But I think the main point is the liquidity. If they can change that then you'll see the stock prices rally much more. Okay, great answer, yes. So the last question here, I will answer it. Uh, what about remaining stones? You are investing in Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, and Pakistan. But what about Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, and of course, Afghanistan? And the answer is simple. Uh, th those three markets, they don't have a stock market yet. Uh, there's stock exchange, <laughs> stock exchange in Tajikistan so far, I know, but no stocks listed. But nothing uh, right now. I mean, Turkmenistan is completely closed, and Afghanistan, we know the situation is dire there. Uh, we have one company investing in uh, Pakistan, which has a lot of exposure, is exporting to Afghanistan, but that's some kind of indirect play. Okay, great. Thanks a lot for uh, the speakers. This concludes our webinar today. And since we still had some unanswered questions, we will answer them directly by email. And if you have further questions, you can always reach us by uh, email or WhatsApp or phone or whatever. I hope you enjoyed this webinar. We will organize more of these kinds of webinars in the future, and we will announce them in our upcoming monthly newsletters. So please read them, don't just delete them. Good night to all participants in Asia uh, and in the others. Uh, uh, areas enjoy the rest of the day. Bye-bye.